So today we're going to move into Fatal Strategies. Now this text came out in the early 80s, in 83 I believe, or let me make sure that that wasn't the translation. Uh, yeah, 83, originally titled Les Stratégies Fatales. Um, and this is a rather provocative text because it's taking on a number of things, including Hegel, to which I'm sure the Hegelians would uh, disapprove. I don't know many of them, and I haven't spoken to what they might say with regards to this this text because it's rather provocative and it's rather polemic. But I don't know what the contemporary status of Hegelian thought is these days. So if anyone listening is happens to be versed in that and would have something to say, I'd be really curious. But he starts at the book with the first chapter titled "Ecstasy and Inertia" by stating that the world is not dialectical. It is sworn to extremes, not to equilibrium, sworn to radical antagonism, not to reconciliation or synthesis. So in this, it, this is interesting because it doesn't, he doesn't, he's not saying that the world is no longer dialectical, as though such a thing may have ever existed. Because dialectics is a, is a thought process that for him would be, it's rather weak, it, it's boring, um, would probably be a better word. Now, Baudrillard is interested, in it, and he elaborates on this in a number of other texts, Passwords being one of them, which uh, can be found online and YouTube, only in French, though. And there is the English translated version, but all throughout Baudrillard's work, he's very much interested in binaries, which would seem to run conflictually to his claim here, because dialectics and binaries do go hand in hand in some way. So if we think back to seduction... When dealing with the distinction between, let's say, hot and cold, it is not as though it is not as though these two things exist um, absolutely or certainly in space, but rather are defined by each other. Moreover, Bojer takes this hypothesis further to suggest that each one is seduced by the other, where the two fold into one another, determining, I guess the boundary that is supposed to bifurcate them, at the same time calling into question their constitutive elements. So what it means to be hot, what it means to be cold, what it means to be absent, what it means to be present. These things are all called into question at all times. So this is very much in opposition to dialectical thought because there, it's not as though uh, there, there is a resolution between the two components. Rather, there's always something of an antagonism, a playing going on, if you will, where one is always taking and borrowing from the other. So in this way, they are sworn to extremes in, in his terms here. Now, as he did, or as I kind of observed, he's not stating that there has been an end to dialectics, but rather this has been a condition that's been going on for a while. There is something to say about the contemporary conditions of this of the status of this kind of binaural movement today. And that's what I think this, this book is really getting at, is Baudrillard really honing in on his own thought with regards to uh, today and what it means in relation to seduction, what it means in relation to the challenge, to the gift, all these things and how they work in relation to advanced industrial capital or globalism to be a little bit more precise. So there are real-life examples of things that have attempted to take on too heavily the elements of the other thing within the binary. So for instance, imagine a thing of beauty that has absorbed all the energy of the ugly. That's fashion. Imagine the true that has absorbed all the energy of the false. There you have simulation. Now this, we can only assume, is the form of simulation that is an oppressive one, because he flip-flops between the two, where at one moment it seems as though he's kind of, um, he wants to challenge simulation, and then on the other hand he wants to applaud it, or at another moment he wants to applaud it. He wants to recognize the potential in recognizing things as signs. So for him, a strategy does not involve taking on the other half or the other side of a binary head-on. Rather, if there is to be something of movement, 
it is a movement that is located on one side. So rather than looking for the false as opposed to the true, we must have looked for we must look for the truer than the true. At the same at the same moment, we must also look for the falser than the false. Now this is the condition that we find ourselves in, precisely because we live in a, in, we live in a system that is obscene, and a system that feeds off of itself, that derives things to their logical conclusions, we must propose, and this is where the title comes in, something of a fatal strategy that imagines the possibility, to some extent, of an endpoint within that framework that can only come about by s pushing the system to its conclusion. Or, continuing on with that train of thought I proposed earlier, the only way to end beauty or to challenge it or to challenge truth, not to oppose it with the mirror of itself, but rather drive it to the point that it can no longer be itself. Or, in term, and this changes through a little bit later on in his thinking about uh, the Gulf War and the and 9/11, uh, that what is required is something of a gift that cannot be returned. So, in a sense, he comes back to that uh, Mausian rhetoric dealing with uh, the gift potlatch and the counter gift, and how that plays into this is brought out in more detail in those later texts. But for now, he lays out the strategy something almost like like this in the form of a fatal strategy that, like I said, drives things to their logical conclusion. This is because we have, like I stated, arrived at a point where there has just been an over excess or an overabundance of things produced. So this comes out in a certain form that he gives us here, thinking about the social, where what might also make us wonder is this going beyond the social, the eruption of the more social than social, the mass. This is a social that has absorbed all the inverse energies of the antisocial, or inertia, of inertia, resistance, and silence. Now, this is this is incredibly difficult to deal with because it seems so uh, abundantly Hegelian, like there is this dialectical movement in a sense. But what Baudrillard is, and this is really, I think, takes some reading into him to get this out of him, but. It's that moment that two sides of a, of a binary come together and homogenize, where there is not anymore a distinction between one side and another, but rather a kind of uh, blood, a kind of meshing of the two that we see oppression begin for Baudrillard. So he continues this train of thought when he says that here the logic of the social reaches its limit, the point where it inverts its finalities and reaches its point of inertia and extermination, but at the same time approaches ecstasy. Masses are the ecstasy of the social, the ecstatic form of the social, the mirror where it is reflected in all its imminence. Now, if we're going to continue on with him logically, the same must be said of the antisocial, because it is what comes out of, or the masses are what come out of the social absorbing the antisocial. So to take out the term social here and to say that it is the antisocial that sees ecstasy in the form of the masses would not be all that um, radical of an idea given what he's given us here. Because it is in the masses or it is in the moment that the masses are realized that people seem to grow antisocial very, very ironically, in the age of mass communication, people are lonelier than ever. There's, this isn't really a, shouldn't be a surprise, I, I wouldn't think. But just because people are able to communicate, or just because people are able to, are given the semblance of communication, does not mean that they are actually satisfying that, what I will hesitate, hesitatingly, what I will reluctantly call human condition. So in response to this, like to take away from to move away from Baudrillard for a second, we have a very we have a um, an obsession with this idea of getting back to our roots, uh, getting back to what makes us human, communication, like proper relationships, stuff like that, like on YouTube with this self help type, um, you know, millennial uh, kind of feel good stuff. 
But that is really uh, out the window at this point for, for Baudrillard, as he states that a hysteria the inverse of that of finalities, the hysteria of causality, corresponding to the simultaneous erasure of origins and causes, the obsessive search for origin, responsibility, and reference, an attempt to exhaust phenomena back to their infinitesimal causes. Now, if we hold on to the idea that, or his notion of the simulacrum, there is not that possibility of returning to an origin because we are living in a moment where an origin is simply another copy, another image of another image, where beneath it, it's not as though there's a mountain of dirt over truth, and with enough digging, we can get down to it, because all it is is dirt above dirt above dirt above dirt, to the point that perhaps we could dig through it, but we'd only get to the other side of the earth and fall into space, into, into a void, nothingness. So this is a system of endless proliferation, of endless acceleration, where we are, uh, we, where he suggests that we must put information on a diet, or, or ask, should we put information on a diet? Must we remove the fat from the obese, these obese systems, and create disinformation clinics? A kind of narrowing down of this possibility, but to which very much, um, I think very correctly, he says, no, we, this can't happen. It would be, it, it simply seems that the species has crossed some specific, mysterious point from which it is impossible to retreat, decelerate, or slow down. So this is an acceleration that has been mobilized. It has been sort of put into place as a deterrent, oddly enough. We're thinking back to simulacrum simulation where he states that uh, the presence of nuclear weapons is not so that they'll ever be used, but precisely so that it would deter the use of the very nuclear weapons that they represent, very ironically. So what we see is, in a sense, something like a perpetual peace but it's a piece that's very selective. It's a piece that maintains a, a, a very certain status quo, right? We, we can fill in the blanks here with, uh, with who gets to benefit from this sort of systemic uh, acceleration, notably the wealthy, rich white people, while others are just eradicated, museified, or museumified is one of his terms, where they are physically destroyed but then they are respected, quote-unquote, by being put into museums and worshipped in that way, or as sort of embodying uh, an origin or an originary point that we have lost, right? And this comes out in other, other forms where there is a certain uh, rendering people overseas as exotic, tourism being one of these effects or one of the consequences of this system, being a... I guess a desire to go to where things are different, but is not simply different, supposedly less advanced. Now this isn't something that we perhaps consciously think, but it is something that runs under the current of our, uh, the cultural logic of this system of acceleration. So what is at stake even for the people that benefit very literally from this sort of system? Well, for Baudrillard, it isn't, it isn't something necessarily to applaud right away. As he states, um, experts have calculated that the state of emergency decreed by an earthquake, for example, would unleash such a panic that its effects would be greater than the earthquake itself. So he keeps going. It is thus evident that a state or a power sophisticated enough to predict earthquakes and prevent the consequences would constitute a danger to the community and the species much more fantastic than the earthquakes themselves. So this sort of control is not something that the human, I think, would instinctively enjoy. And certainly Baudrillard would agree, as he states that, but never would the dream of an order capable of such a dissuasion of catastrophe. The price would be such that people would at bottom prefer catastrophe. With all its misery, it at least fulfills the prophetic demand for a violent end, whatever that means. And this is just one of the many moments that uh, Baudrillard could, could be challenged for his um, disavowal of that suffering that people experience on a daily basis uh, by, you know, very uh, 
imperial entities that exist today. And what we could ask what role they would play in this system here. I think many of those people would say, God, give me what you know you have, what you are uh, repudiating here, Baudrillard. And it seems odd that Baudrillard feels as though he has the right or that he has the know-how to talk for these people to say this is what they would want this is what they have and this is why they are privileged in that way so there, this is something to consider and to kind of push back on him against or against him with because it does homogenize it is a sort of um, colonial tool that mirrors that same sort of system that he purports to challenge that system of homogenization, of reduction, of anti-seduction, if you will, or, or production, where these people are productive under, um, under this image that he crafts of them in the form of their wants and needs that, that he has illustrated. But he, he suggests this in another way as well, where he takes into account uh, state-run terrorism, of which he says that the same is true of terrorism. What kind of state would be capable of dissuading and annihilating all terrorism in the bud, in the brackets, uh, Germany? It would have to arm itself with such terrorism and generalized terror on every level. If this is the price of security, is everybody deep down dreaming of this? So he's making a reference here to um, the Mogadishu thing with the Bader, uh meinhof gang or group where the, uh, you know, these people were liquidated, essentially. Um, really demonstrating the effectiveness of state power in eradicating terror. So, for for more on that, he he um, expounds on it in in the shadow of the silent majorities. So, for anyone interested, you check that out. Or I did a thing on it here, but you know the book itself is much better than anything I could do. So this pushes us into the second chapter, titled "Figures of the Transpolitical." So the transpolitical is the mode of disappearance of all that, now in brackets, it is no longer the mode of production but the mode of disappearance that, is, that excites us. It is the malicious curvature that puts an end to the horizon of meaning. So the transpolitical is the obscene. The transpolitical doesn't see a distinction between the right and the left, and this is certainly true if we can, you know, take a Marxist stance on this, like uh, hardcore Marxists out there would see right through the rhetoric put forth by the right or the left in the political sphere, at least if we consider uh, the United States, to see right through that and know that beneath it all, there's something else going on. So that all this claim towards transparency, all this claim towards benevolence or, or what have you in either of these spheres, the right or the left, is all in the service of pushing this hidden system forward. So for Baudrillard, it is when the social body loses its law its seen and its stakes, that it also reaches the pure and obscene form we know it to be, its visible and too visible form, its ostentation, ostentation, the investment and overinvestment of all spaces by the social, the spectral and transparent character of the whole remain, remaining unchanged. So this obesity too is too spectral, in no way heavy, it floats in the good conscience of sociality. So what we are left with is a either pataphysics or metaphysics. So pataphysics, he states here really enigmatically, uh, at least this, these possibilities, where pataphysics is that science of imaginary solutions, or it's the, so it's the thing he's kind of interested in in his later work, pataphysician, he claims himself to be, which is difficult to grasp. It's just kind of um, a commitment to the possibility that there, that the solution is the most um, absurd, unintelligible, enigmatic thing that could possibly be solved. And it is, or be surmised, and it is one that is susceptible to change, right? It's kind of the play of solutions. So this pataphysical approach would stand opposed to the American model that sees this endless proliferation of this spectral environment where each cell, each function, each structure is left with the possibility of ramifying, of multiplying indefinitely, of occupying virtually all the space by itself, of monopolizing all the information unto itself. 
where pataphysics wouldn't possibly see any good out of that, right? It, it, this American system is a system of growth for the sake of growth, where we validate ourselves with statistics, we validate ourselves with science and data and, and information that is all in the service of convincing us very strategically that we are real, that there hasn't been anything lost, whatever that might look like. But it's kind of ironic because it grounds us at the same time. It grounds us in a body. It grounds us in, you know, an ontologically determined being with all our physiological science, with all the rhetoric going on today about what should constitute biological differences between, say, men and women. Anything like that operates in the service of consolidating um, a real or a, or, or a truthful person that cannot be uh, undone, in a sense. Whereas the pataphysical approach is that which opposes that. It, it makes a mockery of it, in a sense. So when Baudrillard ever speaks, and there are moments when he speaks about a return, it's a return to enigma. It's a return to the possibility of um, illusion, or it's a return to the possibility of uh, things being susceptible to change, being susceptible to adaptation and development, which he believes being kind of crushed or sequestered by this system of growth, of exploitation, of scientific rationality that grounds things, crystallizes them, if you will. So one such example of this is pornography, which he takes some time to think about. So he states that porn makes sexuality appear, appear superfluous. That is what is obscene. Not that there is too much sex, but that sex is too much. What makes the obese obscene is not that there is too much body, but that the body is superfluous. So, now, this is a theme that has been going on for a while. Uh, take Frankenstein, for instance, where Victor Frankenstein wants to bypass uh, biological reproduction, get rid of the icky, gross woman, uh, and be able to reproduce without going through sex, without going through the, I guess, biologically classical way of, of reproducing. So that is part of this, I think, it's kind of, a, kind of a precursor to this logic that wants to bypass these perhaps, I will reluctantly call innate biological functions, where pornography is one such way to bypass that, where what you see in pornography, at least in 95% of it, is not the realization of, of sex, but rather sex to the nth, nth degree, right? Sex taken to the nth power. But in proper Baudrillardian fashion, he even goes back on what he, what he himself says, where he pretty much states that in these forms of ecstasy, or in the form of the obscene, where the masses are the ecstasy of the social, or pornography is the ecstasy of sex, perhaps there, we are opening up a new, um, I guess a new definition of what it means to be human, and it's not something that uh, would mark a regression or kind of ne negative dialectics, but is really another mode of play. So, in order to kind of affirm this, he, he quotes Kennedy, who says that only tautological sentences are perfectly true, which is very interesting because we are dealing with a system that is very tautological. It's growth for the sake of growth. Why? Because growth is what we need. Like, there, there are no solutions. It's, it's rather a circular pattern that keeps moving in that way. So, there's, the, <laughs> there's always that to entertain. Not, not to say I subscribe to that, but perhaps it's good that he's considering the possibility. So in this system of great growth, if we could call it that, uh, we see, of course, the rise of weapons of mass destruction, because that is, those things don't exist outside of this system of accumulation, and for that reason, to some extent, Baudrillard says that we are all hostages, precisely because we are essentially under the whim of a few select people who, if they hit a few buttons, could bring the world crashing down. So for him, we all now serve as dissuasive arguments, objective hostages. We answer collectively for something, but for what? This is a kind of fate that is fixed, and whose manipulators we can no longer even see. But we know the scales on which our death is decided are no longer in our own hands, and we now live in a state of 
permanent suspension and emergency whose symbol is the nuclear bomb, objective hostages of a savage god, we don't even know what event, what accident will touch off this ultimate manipulation. So we are then hospitalized by society, taken hostage in this way. So it's, uh, it's very easy, I think, to read in this um, why some people, especially those that associate with, with Marxist thought or anything like that, would have a problem with Baudrillard, because he's very much advocating for there being no solution, right? And that people often kind of straw man him like that. Um, but I would go, like to some extent I would agree, but it would take too long to kind of uh, tr try to redeem him a little bit in that way. But I see another problem with this, as it could kind of evoke the idea that the only solution is to kind of um, take up arms and go out into the woods and live by yourself like off the grid, um, which is an idea that I think some people subscribe to, and it does kind of ultra-libertarianism that evokes a ton of uh, issues. And I don't know if there is a way to, considering that, to redeem what he's saying here, because there's no strategy. Eh. Well, perhaps that, that's what he's... Because he, he's crafting out a scene. He's kind of illustrating what we can find ourselves in. And while he's not as clear in proposing um, some sort of resistance or an actual fatal strategy that will drive the system to its end, despite saying that we must drive the system to its end for it to collapse, Besides that, there seems to be a, a lack of that discourse, which doesn't mean, though, that it, it's not possible. It's just, it should be easier with another person. I'd be curious, though, if anyone's actually actually listening to this, if anyone would be, would have an idea of what that would look like, some sort of resistance that would not necessarily take the form of kind of mass protest or a mass resistance, but that would at least be an alternative to simply hiding in the woods with a few shotguns ready to shoot any, any member of the state or anyone that's trying to take your land. And I'd be curious what, what that could look like. But anyways, I, I digress. So for him, the hostage is someone that's caught between life and death. This sort of life and death. This sort of hospitalization in that way where, you know, your fate is essentially unclear. It's at the hands of someone else or in the hands of someone else. So the system does this for a very particular reason, and that is because the system is ashamed of randomness. It is ashamed especially of random death. So for Baudrillard, it is for the purpose of making amends and putting a stop to the scandal of accidental death. Now this is a thesis that he pushed in, or he tried to put forth in uh, Symbolic Exchange and Death, when he outlines the way in which death has sort of been conjured away in favor of, you know, longer lives, uh, increases in, in, you know, um, like a kind of biopolitical, uh, cultural or public consciousness that is in the service of maintaining life. You know, Baudrillard asks why, like, why are we ashamed of death? Well, for him, it's because death holds a sort of radical ambiguity because it marks an end, because it is a sort of zone that we can't ever fully understand, then it would be better for us to just, rather than attaching symbolic value to it in the form of, like, religion or uh, sacrifice or anything like that, it's best if we just try to forget about it. And then elderly people are put in homes. Uh, we have, you know, um, oh God, what is it called? Volunteered at these places forever. Um, palliative care centers where dead people are expected to die under the gaze of the state or the gaze of a certain uh, governmental apparatus. And then he anticipates a sort of uh, possible reputation or possible rebuttal where someone would say, well, thinking about um, people giving their lives for, for certain causes, like in the case of terrorism, uh, what we call terrorism, to which he says that, okay, that's fine, that's all well and good, but that doesn't necessarily mark a return or a sort of redemption of that idea of death that has been lost, but because it is in response to a system that has exercised death, that has conjured death away, um, he states both terrorists and hostages, terrorists and hostages, 
have lost their names, they have all become unnameable. So even the sacrifice of terrorists trying to resolve the situation by their own death has nothing expiatory about it. It raises for only an instant the veil of anonymous terror to which it comes flooding back down and is then made abundantly apparent then made hyper real by being broadcast all over the, the media sphere. And as Baudrillard states, terrorism itself is only a gigantic special effect. Because despite its move to purge the world of its oppression, it only accelerates its effects in, in its negation. So by the negation of a system that has the media apparatuses behind it, that has general public acquiescence, any sort of resistance to that only pushes that system forward. But we must be clear, and this is one of my favorite Baudrillard quotes, where he states that terrorism is still a lesser evil than a police state capable of ending it. So as there is a sort of acquiescence, a sort of relationship between the state and this media machine, it is in that way that it does take on this terroristic function, where, you know, even though it does drop bombs, very literally, it deploys a terroristic media campaign in favor of, you know, pushing a, in the case of the United States, uh, America number one type thing, or anything like that. And the solution to this, quite simply, is if you want no more terrorism, then you must renounce information itself because of the way that terrorism is actually feeds that system of information, feeds that media sphere. The only way to get at the heart of you know, this sort of oppression is in the form of, or by challenging the dissemination of information. Very, very ironic given what I'm trying to do here on YouTube. So in the being rendered hostage or being rendered terrorist, which most of us would fall into either one of those categories as we would engage with the media machine or with the neo-imperial efforts of the United States and, and other quote-unquote first world countries or are the victims of said violence we can be said to be um, taken outside of ourselves in that way, we disembodied in that way. So for Baudrillard we are ripped too violently from reality to have it be returned to us. So in that sense, because there has been a sort of disembodiment, if we can accept what Baudrillard is saying here, then we enter the realm of the inexchangeable, where the hostage cannot be exchanged for something else precisely because they have lost that identity, in a sense. And we just take this metaphorically, like obviously the hostage can be uh, exchanged for something else. But he says this to make an interesting point, where... Uh, the terrorist situation then marks an end to the conditions of a sort of deterred or deferred utopia that is exchange and competition and capital, right? So there is something of a realization of a utopian moment in this sort of exchange, precisely because we see the end of the possibility for exchange, so the end of the capitalist notion. We see the end of... Um, the Oedipal notion, precisely because the supposed father, supposed Oedipal complex or whatever, all the characters involved have become faceless, a sort of homogenization, so no more of that struggle, that's out the window. All in this favor, all in favor of a sort of uh, homogenization between either, you know, hostage or terrorist in, in Baudrillard's really facile uh, reduction of the two. But it is, it is interesting, nonetheless. So we must, in opposition to this system, uh, he proposes strategy of seduction once again. So seduction being that thing against production, seduction being um, that which is in support of enigma, in support of the free flow of things, is sort of n not in like the Delisian sense, because that it would imply too much of a, a possibility of mobilizing said mobilization or, or flowness, but rather just the possibility for things to change period. Uh, we must propose, or he suggests that we propose this strategy of seduction against this prolific terrorist system of information. Otherwise, uh, along with the end of the secret, 
uh, if all enigmas are resolved, the stars will go out. If everything secret is returned to the visible, and more than to the visible, to obscene obviousness, so the obscene is the more visible than the visible, if all illusion is returned to transparency, then heaven becomes indifferent to the earth. In our culture, everything is sexualized before disappearing. We mustn't believe, then, as he says, that we are living the realization of some evil utopia. We are living the realization of utopia, period. That is to say, it's collapse into the real. And we are then caught in this sort of utopia, in the ecstasy of communication. So that's the title of one of his other later texts in 87, so maybe a couple after this one, um, where the ecstasy of communication is like, you know, symptomatic of the system of growth for growth. Well, it's communication for the sake of communication. Now, this is opposed to the drama, he says, of alienation, or the possibility of there being some kind of, um, something redemptive or something romantic about being alienated or being alone, or that quote that uh, Hannah Arendt uses at the end of the, actually I have it right here, at the end of the human condition, when she says that, or when she quotes, gosh, who was it? Um, when she quotes Cato, who says that never is he more active than when he does nothing, never is he less alone than when he is by himself, so that thinking about the thinking subject uh, in, in the case of being by themselves and how that brings a person into being you know, an individual in that way and how that's been warded off, right? It's strange if someone doesn't communicate, if someone doesn't have uh, a constant connection to cyberspace, to the net, to the hive mind. And those people, people are looked at as though they're they're lepers or something like that, as though they, they really um, have something off about them, which is, which is odd, because this is a very new development in the course of human evolution. And as from there, we move into chapter 3, dealing with, or titled, Ironic Strategies, where Lodgerd starts out by saying, we have transgressed everything, including the limits of seen and truth. So, more of what he was saying uh, here, and there is going to be some repetition, so for those listening, I'm trying to really uh, filter through some of that, but I will overlap a little bit, and, and sorry about that. What we are left with in this system, or in this world, are rational systems of morality, value, science, reason, command, only the linear evolution of societies, their visible history. But the deeper energy that pushes even these things forward comes from elsewhere, from prestige, challenge from all the seductive or antagonistic impulses, including suicidal ones, which have nothing to do with the asocial, asocial morality or morality of history or progress. So glory, our ancestors would have said, is more powerful than merit, and glory is immoral. The debauchery of signs in every domain is much more powerful than reality, and the debauchery of signs is immortal. Immoral. And it could be immortal. But in that way, um, he's, he's outlining what exists underneath, right? So, for Baudrillard, and this is one of the important things to get out of him, at least in my reading, is that um, whatever he claims is at a loss. Whatever he claims is being sequestered um, by these, system, these irrational systems or hyper-reality, what have you, can never fully be uh, removed. So these things are always present. They always already um, guide, form, um, sort of exist behind behind the scenes. They're kind of godlike in that way. But like, and very much in the same way, like God, God rarely makes itself uh, seen or heard, but only comes out in very enig enigmatic points. We think of the, the thesis, God works in mysterious ways. Well, in that way, so does seduction. So in contrast to this, this divine system, we have the biological power of change, this immoral energy of transformation for and against all value systems, and that is the United States. In spite of its morality, Puritan, Puritanism, obsession with virtue, and pragmatic idealism, everything there changes irresistibly according to an impulse that is not at all one of progress, 
by definition linear. No, the true motor, motor is the objection of free enterprise. Not objection, but abjection. So that loss, or that free market type system, that is more an extension of the system than, or of this thing that Baudrillard is describing rather than uh, a precursor to it. But this free enterprise system being that ideal form of, you know, zero barriers, of uh, deregulation, that sees no limits, that sees nothing out of bounds, where everything can be potentiated, everything can be mobilized in favor of whatever kind of, you know, the, whatever media campaign, whatever personal or public relations um, campaign, so as to not only realize um, or have certain people realize a great deal of wealth or gain a great deal of wealth or maintain power, but to actually maintain that very logic of the system itself. So it does serve a dual function in that way. Like, uh, I must admit, I enjoy watching uh, Shark Tank or Dragon's Den for uh, Canadians. And that is one show where we see this occurring very much, where you see people who are already rich, deplorably rich, who can cycle through people, like, unbelievably quickly, and with that, not only gain wealth to an exponentially gross degree, to an exponential degree, anyways, but that is, uh, it does affirm the notion that we, we have an obsession with speed, with the way in which, or the extent to which we are obsessed with speed, to just reiterate, thinking of course here of, uh, of Virilio in his theory of speed, and just our over, our cultural obsession with it, and what effect that that has on our relationships to one another, on our relationships to this thing called culture, if we can say that such a thing exists, and what that necessarily looks like, but how all of these things play something of a role in that. The old formations of power in relation to this are totally out the window. You know, the Machiavellian ideas, gone. What we have entered here is a new phase, where power doesn't have a face, right? Where speed can't be depicted, can't be illustrated. So despite the analogy I gave, or the, any of the illusions that Baudrillard puts forth, it can never actually give it that face, right? Because power is, you know, thinking about the way that Foucault might illustrate it, you know, it exists at the capillary level. It can't, there is no locus of it. So for that reason, um, Baudrillard states that they, those people that claim to have power, only have banal strategies of power. So, you know, the people that want to be tyrants, think about current president of the United States, for instance, they only occupy banal strategies of power. Whereas, other politicians have always known that power is never this unilateral ability of disposing of another's will, but always the subtle and ambiguous orchestration of its own disappearance. They know that power, like truth, is the empty place you must know how never to occupy, but that you must know how to produce so that others will be swallowed up by it. On the other hand, power that insists on occupying this place, power that incarnates power as obscene and impure, and sooner or later collapses in its blood and ridicule. And I think that that is precisely because it is, it is given a face that is attached to a specific point, whereas the system of speed, of progression, doesn't allow for that sort of crystallization to occur. Where at one point we are at one thing, the next second we're on something else. Think about the news media cycles where you read something in the morning and by the time night rolls around it feels like old news or feels like it's a few weeks old like oh my god especially if you consider days on end like you know i'll hear about things and i'll be like oh yeah that was what that was last month or something and find out oh it's last week it, it's really quite absurd but it is that system that is being maintained no matter who claims to be in power because the system is so effective at crafting out these spaces of power as though the president has any real control over advanced capital or this broader system of 
kind of the uh, remnants of modernity, desire to know, to uncover, to trace, as though anyone occupying a position of power can affect that. But we are led to believe it, and that is maintained, where there are, there, which isn't to say that certain political solutions cannot be, um, cannot come about by putting forth uh, political action. Like, I am certainly not an advocate for such apathetic views. But to get at the thing that Bojard is describing here is a lot more complex, and it's a lot more difficult, not to say that it's uh, resistant to a sort of pragmatics, but that it is something that would demand us to really think about how we can oppose the system without simply mirroring it. And that is because, in my mind, like, like in uh, particle physics or in science, you cannot locate a particle while simultaneously calculating its velocity, like the system itself. You cannot find out how fast it is going, where it is going, while simultaneously giving it a face and saying, oh, this is what, what you are, this is where you, where you are right now, and then you can then mount a strategy against it, because by the time any sort of effective strategy has been mounted, the system has changed. It has gone somewhere else, it has taken on a new face. And in opposition to all this, Baudrillard thinks of, like, um, what, you know, again, what seduction looks like in relation to this. And he gives this rather um, comical uh, little story, little, it's not an anecdote, whatever you call it, the short story, the parable or something, where he says that stories of reversibility are always the funniest, like the one about the rat and the psychologist. The rat tells about how he ended up by perfectly conditioning the psychologist to give him a piece of bread every time he lifted the gate of his cage. Based on this story, you could imagine on the level of scientific observation that the experiment would have been faked, not involuntarily altered by the observer, but faked by the object, with the purpose of amusement or vengeance, as in the un unintelligible trajectories of particles, or better yet, that the object only pretends to obey the law of physics because it gives so much pleasure to the observer. Now this is an interesting thing for him to say, and I think that it's, in his mind, this is how a theory of resistance is to be realized, in the form of its reversal, in a sort of playfulness, where Baudrillard makes a mockery of this idea of the, you know, the uh, objective scientific gaze, in the case of the rat, by suggesting that it is the rat that is toying with the, um, uh, the scientist. So taking this idea of this hyper-rational ideal, and turning it on its head, now the, the left, or those people that supposedly occupy the left, are very much um, or, sorry, my power just jumped for a second, but are very much, uh, at fault with this, and I think of like figures like Bill Maher, for instance, you know, the hyper-rationalistic left that proclaims to have the solutions to, like, well, that, that's not true, but looks down upon people that don't subscribe to their views as being just stupid, being, you know, uneducated, anything like that, which is just part of this very system, to which, keeping up with this uh, Baudrillardian, I guess, story, uh, it is those people that are making a mockery of the uh, the intellectual left by making them think themselves superior, which isn't surely isn't the case, but it's just an interesting kind of thought experiment that uh, imagine the world in those terms as supposed as opposed to the easy locations of power, authority, knowledge. So these people that occupy any of the broad you know categories I've outlined, whether it be the intellectual left or the deplorable uh, right or just uneducated country folk, um, all these can't be, these people can't actually be represented, right? So when we speak about them, we are at best speaking about a metaphor. We are speaking about um, an image of an ideal. So for Baudrillard, however, however you perfect them, poles will never represent anything because the rule of their game is representation. Their logic is perfectly attuned to objectivity. But at the end of the process, there is no object. There is therefore objectivity in its pure state. Marvelous mockery. This is true for all of the media. When you're in simulation, that is, 
in the neither true nor false, all moral science is perfectly hypocritical. So how polls like the broad cultural logic of the system, uh, they, they work in the service of maintaining, affirming, and validating not only themselves, but their object of study, which they purport to be real, to be to have this um, ontological condition that can be evaluated, but is all in the service of confirming and validating um, the existence or the need for there to be such things like a poll, like a survey that is supposed to give real objective results or um, opinions. What this has culminated into then is that the masses know that they know nothing and they have no desire. The masses know they are powerless and they don't want power. We reproach them vigorously for these signs of stupidity and passivity, but they're not that at all. The masses are very snobbish. They act like Brumel and sovereignty delegate, sovereignly delegate the faculty of choice to someone else in a sort of game of irresponsibility, ironic challenge, sovereign lack of will, or secret ruse. All mediators, political, intellectual, heirs to the philosophers of the Enlightenment in their contempt of the masses are only good basically for this, to administer by delegation by proxy this tedious business of power and will, to relieve the masses of their transcendence for the greater, greater pleasure, and then to reward them with the spect spectacle of it. Vicarious, to recall Veblen's concept, the status of these privileged classes whose will, will would have been diverted without their realizing it, toward the secret finalities of the very masses they despise. So despite all this, despite the attempt to try to locate in the masses this deplorability, this stupidity, this kind of nonsensical uh, figure, Baudrillard states, very ironically, that we would do well to think of them as being delusive, elusive, uh, employing a, an elusive strategy, corresponding to an unconscious that is finally ironic, joyous, and seductive. So in a sense, like he stated earlier, thinking about ecstasy, the ecstasy of communication or whatever, perhaps we are entering a phase that is not something to be feared, where this idea of the masses is in itself a liberatory or something of a positive movement throughout history. And whether or not you know you buy that is totally up to you, but it's interesting nonetheless. But yeah, I think it's on that note I'll I'll tune out here into one of the kind of sub-chapters or one of the subsections here in this chapter. And I hope, like, I like this book a lot. Every time I read it, I have, you know, I have as many new problems with it as I have new applause for it. Um, because, it, you know, gets reading this, it gets to a point when you kind of want... I don't know how many times I've read this now, but it feels like I want more of a pragmatics behind it, maybe that's just me entering the system too much, who knows, but me wanting to be, uh, to attach something real to it, but I hope someone would have something of a rebuttal to that, or, or can get more of it out of this, or hope that, you know, perhaps you'll speak of, uh, positively of what I've had to say, but anyways, for any of those that listen this far, thanks a lot, I hope that you got something out of it, if not, sorry. I'll try to be better next time. Anyways, 